Joshua 10, 12. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Anthony Gaudiano. Today is the 18th of January, the year 2020. Last year, about this time, late fall, I received some calendars in the mail, as we all do. And uh, again, the organization which has sent me this calendar for probably 14 or 15 years is in the back of their very well written magazine called The Faith. And it's a, it's a, on the back page, it has the calendar. Well, every year the calendar has, as you can see perhaps here, it has two lists of dates the so-called early year and the later year. About that time, I got something in the, in the mail, uh, email, and it was a person who was decrying the fact that there were different calendars amongst the congregation. And I don't know what happened, but for some reason, I just got uh, turned in the direction of answering that question. And I spent the next three and a half to four months uh, working on it. And it ended up being this paper here, which is 17 pages long. It took me about that long to write it. There was a lot of research in it, but it was a blessing to me. It was like somebody turning a light on. Things just kind of fell into place. And suddenly there were answers to the question, why are there different calendars amongst congregation? Here's a, one congregation that shows two calendars on the same page. Well, I, uh, I didn't get much response when I mailed this paper out to about 25 or so recipients. Almost every congregation, the Alvis congregation I knew, got a copy. And um, the uh, congregation of Yah in Marseille, Illinois, uh, Mike Abiduska uh, published it in the form of a little booklet. And his, his wife, Beverly, graciously typed it over and over and over and over for me. Such is the life of a proofreader. It's, th it's a thankless job. So they all went out and I didn't think there was anything going to come of it, but I got this month's Faith magazine in the mail. And of course, I turned to the back page and lo and behold, there's one calendar. And that calendar is the same as we keep. Now, uh, in, this, in, in previous booklets, and in fact, on this very booklet, they lead uh, off the bottom paragraph with this sentence. The faith editor and staff apologize for any uncertainty of the dates for the Passover memorial and feast for the year 2020. Our normal calculations in the past year have concern on sighting the new moon of Abib falling closest to the vernal equinox with Passover memorial celebrated on and after the vernal equinox. Well, <laughs> I wrote them a letter to accompany the little booklet that I sent them. And I, I was very nice about it. Uh, that might not be characteristic of me, but I, w I really was diplomatic to show them that if you keep the year at the first day of the year before the spring equinox, that is the winter. So you can't do it. And yet for years and years and years, that's what was being done. It's in the month of Adar not the month of Aviv. And yet, for years and years and years, that's what was being done. 
enough of that. It just goes to show that if one uh, bases one's belief on the scriptures, it will eventually trickle down to those who need to hear it. Now, having said that, I might be <laughs> uh, disappointed to find in future years that they change back again. Nevertheless, the title of my sermon today is Beginning the, uh, determining the beginning of the scriptural year. Now, I chose this for a particular reason. This, this was a paper seeking the rationales that various congregations were using. And as I've said before, I have requested the formal rationales from these congregations and not received one. Now, our rationale here is very simple. We look for the spring equinox, the first new moon afterwards, it's the first day of the scriptural year, first new moon afterwards. But you can go to a congregation that's keeping the conjunction and ask them how they determine it. Now we all here determine it just like I said, but when you ask them, they have A, no formal rationale, and B, None have ever determined the beginning of the scriptural year using the conjunction theory, and I stress theory. None have ever done it themselves. They all revert to published tables from an observatory somewhere. Well, let's look at the facts. In Genesis 1, 16 to 17, the sun, the moon, and the stars were given by, were given to mankind by Almighty Yahweh for four purposes. And of course, we know them to be for signs, for appointed times, days, and years. In Joshua 10, 12, the sun and the moon were told to stand still to enable the ancient Hebrews to win the battle at Gibbon and Aayon. Joshua 10, 12. Genesis 11, uh, 7, 11, and 8, 4 show that Noah knew when the scriptural year began. He embarked on the 17th day, it's in the Holy Word, uh, of the fifth moon, a lunar month, and he debarked on the 17th day of the seventh moon. The voyage lasted 150 days. Moons then were numbered sequentially from the first day of the first month of a scriptural year. But nowhere in scripture is how these ancient peoples determine that first day. Few people today know that the date of Almighty Yahweh's appointed times in Leviticus 23.3 are determined by counting days and moons beginning with the first day of the scriptural year. Ancient people were agrarian, agrarian and herdsmen. They lived close to nature, rising at dawn and working until dusk. Experience accumulated over the years was passed down to succeeding generations and became common knowledge. Common knowledge gained from astronomical observation existed amongst the Hebrews, other peoples in the region, those on distant continents, and those on islands in the sea. Completely disconnected people, but the same, essentially the same common knowledge. Yet today, that common knowledge is essentially lost. Thankfully, there are clues in scriptures which enable a person today to discern how the beginning of a scriptural year was determined in ancient times. There are circular, uh, secular clues also. First new moon. In Exodus 12, 2 are the words given by the Almighty Yahweh to Moses. Quote, This new moon is the beginning of new moons for you. It is the first new moon of the year for you, close quotes. 
The phrase new moon refers to Moses' observing the first crescent new moon. Today, astronomers use the phrase astronomical new moon to indicate the moon at conjunction. When the moon is in instantaneous alignment between the earth and the sun, it is called a lunar conjunction. The moon is not visible from earth then because of the glare of the sun. Sun, earth, moon. Sun, earth, moon. When the sun is on this side because of the angle that the moon orbits the earth, sunlight shines on the moon. So if you're on earth looking this way, what you see is shadow. When it goes around to, uh, is a full moon, bright. When it goes around to the opposite side, you see the back side of the moon. So you cannot see the moon for about three and a half days during a conjunction. Now the earliest conjunction, uh, the earliest time, and it's called age by astronomers, the, er the shortest age that the moon has been seen on record has been when it was about 24 years old, 24 hours old. So that's one day. Sometimes it's significantly longer, but it's only ever been claimed to be 14 hours old and be seen. The moon is not visible from the earth uh, during a lunar conjunction because of the glare of the sun. The moon goes into and out of a lunar conjunction over a variable period of three and to three and a half, uh, of one to three and a half days. In Exodus 12, 2, the word first is strong 72.23. It is defined as first in place or time. And I put that in here even though it's a bit trying because I want to emphasize that it is the first. In Exodus 13.4, the first new moon is given its name. Quote, this day you are going out in the new moon of ripe grain. Close quotes. He, in Hebrew, that is Abib. You looking for the definition of Abib? That's it. This verse from the Shachan Bible is a more literal translation than in most versions. After the Babylonian captivity of the kingdom of Judah, which was in 605 to 536 BCE, Ezra the scribe adapted the by then familiar name of moons of the Babylonian calendar for the Jewish calendar. Remember, they've been in captivity 70 years. The first Babylonian moon named Nisanu became Nisan, the first moon of the Jewish calendar. The wording of Exodus 13.4 gives a clue to the approximate time of the year when the Exodus began from Egypt. Barley is the grain being referred to. It is sown in the early winter, germinates under snow and ice, and it matures in about 89 days in the early spring of the following year. The maturity of barley occurs earlier in Egypt than in Israel because Egypt is generally warmer, being further south. Exodus 13.4 indicated that the first moon of Eid occurred in the spring. The barley occurred and the name from which it came is in the spring. I'm going to emphasize here over and over a couple of times uh, this business about the barley occurring in the spring. The general time of the year when the first new moon of the scriptural year occurs was known by the translators of the 1611 edition King James Version Bible. The 1611 KJV was the first widely available Bible in English. It is a translation from ancient manuscripts. In archaic English, 2 Samuel 11.1 1 reads, quote, and it came to pass, pass is spelled P-A-S-S-E, and it came to pass that, and then there's a little plus sign. 
And it came to pass that after three year Y-E-E-R-E -E -E, was expired at the time when kings go, G-O-E, fourth F-O-O-R-T-H, to battle, B-A-T-T-E-L-L, -L, in parentheses, uh, in italics, close parentheses. The plus symbol within the verse refers to a sidebar note which shows the words as translated from Hebrew manuscripts, quote, Hebrew, at the return, R-E-T-U-R-N-E, -R -E, of the Y-E-E-R-E. -E -R -E. Instead of utilizing the archaic English word, R-E-T-U-R-N-E, -E, seen in the sidebar, the 1611 translators chose to substitute the word expired in the verse. That word is Strong's 8666, Tishuba, defined as a reoccurrence, parentheses, a reoccurrence of time or place, close parentheses, a reply as a reply that has been returned, answer to be expired to return. The meaning of Tishuba is a reoccurring time period that has ended or is about to end. Turn, return, and end of the year. Striving for accuracy, some modern Bible version utilized verbatim words seen in the sidebar of the 1611 KJV, expect, except spell them in modern English, i.e., at the return, R-E-T-U-R-N-E, -E, of the year, close quote. At 2 Samuel 11.1, 1, some Bible versions use the phrase turn of the year. Other versions use the phrase at the start of the year and others at the return of the year. Typical verses are in 1 Kings 20, 22, and 26. And the prophet came near to the king of Israel and said unto him, Go, strengthen yourself and mark and see what you do. For at the return of the year, the king of Syria will come up against you. First Chronicles 20 and 1. And it came to pass at the time of the year, uh, at the return of the year, at the time when kings go out to battle. And Second Chronicles 36.10. And at the return of the year, the king Nebuchadnezzar sent and brought him to Babylon with good vessels of the house of Yahweh. These verses relate to the spring of the year that follows the day of the spring equinox. That day varies between March the 19th and the 21st because of profession, or the slow wobble, of the earth on its axis. There are similar references to the turn of the year in the apocryphal book of Jasher four in, in 4 and 3, 6 and 38, 17 and 11, 24 and 19, 41 and 1, 45 and 29, 50 and 7, 61 and 23, and 62, 14. Other Bible versions use the word turn instead of return. Neither word identifies the season when the kings go to battle. The Jerusalem Bible, which is a modern translation, identifies the season of the year when the Kings go to battle in 2 Samuel 11.1 1, as, quote, the spring of the year, close quotes. They're very definite about it. Spring of the year. Mankind observed that at certain times of the year, the weather changed from hot to cold and back again, and the amount of daylight changed from long to short and back again. And they began to associate these and other events that reoccurred at a certain time of the year. Second Samuel 11.1 1 shows it was common knowledge that spring was the optimum time to conduct military campaigns in ancient Israel. The air temperature would be getting increasingly warmer, which caused snow and ice to melt. The latter rains would have ended and the ground would be getting firm enough to support marching soldiers and wagons loaded with provisions. Spring is when edible plants sprout, 
grow and become food for men and fodder for their beasts. If a campaign was expected to be long, it can continue into the summer, autumn, and early winter. Spring alone has these advantages. Ancient Israel had only two seasons, a plowing planting season, which followed the early rains, and a harvesting gathering season, which followed the latter rains. The four seasons known today are of Roman origin. They're not ancient. Ancient people thought the sun moved across the sky. They did not realize that the rotation of Earth gave apparent motion to the sun, which is stationary in the center of the solar system. The planets in the solar system orbit the sun theoretically within a disk-like ecliptic plane. Even though facts in the verses previously mentioned generally relate to the spring of the year, they do not reveal the astronomical point by which the ancients could accurately determine the beginning of the year. That point is the spring equinox. The word equinox from Latin meant equal nights. The word is meaningless without a way of reckoning time as with a clock to measure light and dark portions during one revolution of the earth. During an equinox, the period, uh, time period of day and night are equal only at the equator. The word equinox today refers to two points in the Earth's orbit when the Earth's equator crosses the ecliptic plane. This occurs because the Earth's axis is inclined 23.4 degrees to the ecliptic plane and its poles point in the same direction throughout its orbit. Once every six months in the spring and autumn of Northern Hemisphere, the Earth's equator is perpendicular to the sun at an equinox, two points. The day of an equinox could be determined anciently by observing the straight line shadow of the sun behind a vertical object. The movement of the shadow is because of the counterclockwise rotation of the Earth. On each of the two days of a year when an equinox occurs, the apparent motion of the sun is to rise due east and set due west. Ancient used a sun pole, a pole gnome, a plumb line, etc., to observe the shadow. According to Bradley E. Schaefer, professor, LSU University, Baton Rouge, in his book, Remarkable, Remarkable Science of Ancient Astronomy, the origin of the gnome are lost far back into Neolithic times, that's 3500 BCE or earlier, and has, and its use has been worldwide. The preponderance of evidence proves that the time period indicated in 2 Samuel 11.1 1, and other similar verses is indeed the spring of a lunar solar year, Tukufa. The word equinox has no equivalent meaning in Hebrew. However, most Bible scholar, scholars agree the word is synonymous with the Hebrew word Tukufa, which is Strong's 86.22 defined as a revolution, that is, of the sun, course of time, a lapse, a circuit to come about, end. This describes the reoccurring solar events caused by the sun only without involvement of the moon. These events are the spring and autumnal equinox and the summer and winter solstice. According to Gill's exposition on the Targum, show 2 Samuel 11.1 1 as, quote, at the end of the year, concluded with the end of the last Hebrew month, Adar. So uh, it's the end of the lunar solar year, the Hebrew year, the scriptural year, and they're talking about the beginning of the next year. Not in Adar, the next year begins with the Vib. Western horizon. With a compass, 
compass. One can look due west. You can see this is the mark for north. Turn the needle around, looking due, due north. This is east, and straight behind me is west. And t uh, one, with a compass, one can look due west, 270 degree azimuth. That's what this is. When you're at the compass rows, standing on the compass, you're looking at asthma. This is altitude. One with, uh, with a compass, one can look due west, 270 degrees asthma, and take superimposed photographs of the sun's apparent path descending at the inclination angle of the earth to a setting point on the western horizon. Each evening, the setting point will move toward or away from the 270-degree mark. On the day of an equinox, the sun will set over the 270-degree mark. And after an equinox, the sun will set sequentially at points greater or lesser than 270 degrees and continue in that direction until the day of the solstice. Then the sun's setting point will reverse direction and head toward 270 degrees again for the day of an equinox. So it's equinox, solstice, equinox, solstice, equinox, solstice, equinox, solstice. Between the two points of the equinox are the solstices. The Hebrew definition tekufa tends to fit the apparent circuit traveled by the sun. But the use of a compass is not mentioned in scripture, nor are lodestones, which came much er later. That's a, essentially a piece of naturally formed iron that acquires magnetic properties and it was used by mariners. If you tie it in the middle on the string, it'll swing around just like the needle on the compass. It is much more likely that the widely known gnome was used in some form. And I'm going to show that in just a second. Some people assume the meaning of the phrase, the turn of the year in 2 Samuel 1, 11, 1, is where the weather changes following the spring and autumnal equinox. Actually, the weather changes more significantly at the solstices. This is because that the time of the year, that time of the year corresponds to the apogee and the perigee, respectively, of the Earth's somewhat elliptical orbit around the sun and because of the inclination of the Earth's axis. The end of the year, or year's end, essentially occurs with the end of the harvesting gathering season of grapes and figs and so forth. In Exodus 34.2, Second Chronicles 24.3, etc., the time period mentioned relates to the autumnal equinox. For most years, for most years, the day of trumpets, the day of atonement, the seven days of tabernacles, and the day of Solomon's assembly occur after the autumnal equinox. From Exodus 9.31, it is clear that the plague of hail on Egypt occurred in the late winter or early spring. How do we know this? We know it because the flax and the barley crop were destroyed by hail since they were at maturity. The wheat and the spelt were not destroyed because they had not grown. Wheat does not need reach maturity until about a month after barley if both are sown at the same time. The beginning of the year, scriptural year. The scriptural year begins after the spring equinox with the sighting of the first new moon crescent, well, the first crescent new moon at Jerusalem. A crescent new moon on or before the spring equinox cannot be used to begin the year because then is winter parentheses, not spring, close parentheses, in the 12th month, in the 12th moon, Adar, parentheses, not the first moon, Aviv. 
the day that begins in a day that begins in winter is a day thereof until it ends however reckoned midnight to midnight sunset to sunset technically the spring equinox is the last day of winter because it begins in winter and there is no such thing as a partial day between seasons spring begins at sunset of the day of the spring equinox it is similar with the autumnal equinox and solstices life or death matter concerning Aaron a life or death matter concerned Aaron uh, concerning his observance of the first crescent new moon after the spring equinox and proclaiming it as first of Eve this can be seen in Leviticus 16 2 quote and Yahweh said unto Moses speaking to thy brother Aaron that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat which is upon the ark that he die not for I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat mercy seat now that cloud uh, went up and never came down in the second month uh, 20th day of the second year later scriptures explain that Aaron could only go behind the veil in the tabernacle on the day of atonement without dying Aaron had to be able to determine the first day of the scriptural year to know when the tenth day of the seventh moon Tishri would occur Aaron and the high priest that came after him observed the sun, the moon, and the stars to begin the scriptural year and did so until the destruction of the second temple in 70 CE. Scripture shows that Aaron obeyed Yahweh and died a natural death. No high priest is on record as having died behind the veil, which means they did it the same way from the example that Aaron had had used secular clues in present-day Iraq clay tablets have been found in an area where ancient city of Babylon was located that area is where the Jews were held captive for 70 years approximately uh, in 740 BCE much observed astronomical knowledge originated from the Babylonians you'll see if you do this research a lot of uh, Greek names mentioned but if you dig deep enough you'll find that the Greek got it from <coughs> the Babylonians sometimes not directly indirectly the pyramids at Giza were over a thousand years old when Moses was born and his birth date is somewhat uh, in question 1391 to 1271 BCE Moses' royal education would have included observed astronomical knowledge about the sun, the moon, the stars, equinoxes, solstice, and so forth. Same would have been known by Aaron, Moses' older brother, whom Moses designated as high priest in obedience to the Almighty Yahweh. Secular sources show us that determining the spring equinox and then citing the first crescent new moon for when to begin a sol lunar solar year was common knowledge. The nearby Babylonians made many observations of the crescent new moon and recorded them on clay tablets. Over 8,900 records have been translated in the book Babylonian Chronology 626 BC to, 75, to AD 75 by Richard A. Parker and Waldo H. Derbystein. The tablets show that the Babylonians had a lunar solar year and did similar things to it uh, in relation to it as did the Jews. Both observed crescent new moons. The Babylonian year was based upon observing the first crescent moon after the spring equinox as did the Jews. Clay tablets show that after 547 BCE, the Babylonians intercalated a 13-month about every three years 
to keep the calendar synchronized with the seasons. The tablets contain the name of the king reigning at the time of the recordings. The name of some of those kings are seen in scripture. Babylonian prowess in observing uh, in observed astronomy was significant. Observe astronomy and the Great Pyramid, and I'm about to wrap this up. According to the book Pyramid by David McCauley, the Great Pyramid at Giza, Egypt was finished about 2439 BCE. It took 20 years to build. Arch Egyptian architect Mahun Hotep oriented the foundation of the Great Pyramid to have the entrance face due east and have one side parallel to the straight line shadow of the sun on the day of an equinox. Viewed from above, the pyramids at Giza have a spatial relationship the same as the stars in the constellation Orion's Belt. Hotep accurately determined due north by using a gnome located at the loci of a temporarily curved wall on the pyramid foundation. The wall had a trough which held water. A small float with a vertical mass was placed in the water and aligned with the bright star at its rising. The point was marked on the wall. Then a star, that, when the star set in the west, uh, the same was done on the opposite side of the wall. It was rose here and set here. So they made a mark here and here, divided by two by swinging arcs. They bisected the angle, strung a line between the gnome through the bisected point to the wall on the opposite side, due north. They established due east and west by making a line perpendicular to this line. Now they used water because they would be dead level. It would be dead level. Water seeks its own level. So if they put the little boat over here and they saw the mask and they marked the wall and they floated over here, it would not, this would not occur. There'd be no error. This would be where it would set, bisect the angle. This shows the Egyptian prowess in observed astronomy and mathematics of structures. Egyptians had a 365-day calendar based only upon the sun. Although inaccurate by a fourth of a day each year, it was adopted by the Romans whose calendar initially began in the spring. Neither barley or the lunar conjunction determined the scriptural year. The scriptures do not mention barley as a determinant for beginning the scriptural year only for the wave sheaf offering. Scriptures do not, determ uh, do not mention barley as a determinant for beginning the scriptural year, only for the wave sheaf offering. I don't think anything else needs to be said about barley. Advocates of the conjunction theory claim it was used anciently to determine the first day of the scriptural year. The moon is invisible at its conjunction, and the theory was not and is not common knowledge. It's not like observing uh, the, the crescent new moon after the spring equinox from back to, to Moses to ancient times. This is conjunction theory is very modern. Advocates never provide a formal rationale to explain how the first day of the scriptural year is determined by a moon that can't be seen. Neither do they admit to ever having determined the first day of the year personally. They use modern observatory tables like from the uh, Naval Observ Observatory. Advocates claim that Psalm 81.3, Proverbs 76.10, and Job 26.7 are proof of the first moon as based upon the conjunction. They assert incorrectly that the phrase full moon in these verses is a mistranslation of the Hebrew word K-E-S-H-E, Kesh. 
They claim that the word cache should have been translated concealed, dark, hidden, or covered moon. Jewish sources dispute this. Probably the most thorough study debunking the false claims of the conjunction advocates is by Nathan Lawrence, author of When Does the Biblical Month Begin? Refuting 14 pro-conjunction arguments in favor of the visible crescent. And that was published in 1226-2015. Uh, Conclusion. At the, at the creation of the earth, the Almighty Yahweh gave mankind the sun, the moon, and the stars for signs, appointed times, days, and years. These ancient celestial sources of light are still observable today to determine the first day of the scriptural year, and they will exist until the end of the age. It was common knowledge amongst the Israelites to know when the spring equinox occurred and then to look for the first crescent new moon that followed. The first day of that first moon was one of Eve, the beginning of a scriptural year. Thank you. Now, 